Welcome back. Uh, I hope that those who are online can hear me and, and can see the screen, but that I'm pretty sure because I'm sharing via Zoom, but if you cannot hear me, then let me know. Um, I don't know how you're going to know I'm speaking, but probably you're going to see me on the screen with the mouth moving and, and you're going to conclude that you cannot hear me. Um, so this uh, next one hour and a, and a half, uh, it's uh, to continue on the, on the topic of uh, uh, graphical models. And we are going to use them for a few different tasks. Uh, but before becoming precise, I thought it was useful to get back to the slides that I just quickly jumped. Uh, on the Bayesian networks. Uh, there were a few questions during the breaks, as you can see that the board uh, has a, a bit of uh, um, writing here. And I wanted to touch at least on one question that, uh, that, that, that was uh, asked of me, because I think it's very important in case you miss that, then it's important we are on the same page. Uh, and by the way, I don't have, tones of topics, so I'm not going to be running as I was in the morning. Uh, I want you to you know, stop me and say, let's discuss this. And then if we don't get uh, through all my slides, then that's fine. We don't get through all the slides. Okay, so a little bit different approach from what was used in the morning when I was just quickly going through Bayesian nets. So the point I wanted to mention that was uh, well talked about in the break, is about the direction of the uh, of the edges or, or, or arcs in, in the graph. And it must be clear at this point to you, and if it's not, let's uh, discuss on that, is that uh, the direction of the arc has uh, an important value on how you read the graph, but also is not that important in the sense of uh, causality here. Maybe Alessandro will say something else later, but for me, it's not. So if you have a Bayesian network with two variables, and then you have the arc going from X sub one to X sub two, or from X sub two to X sub one, those represent the same model. Obviously, if you would learn the parameters, you probably would train the model a little bit different because in one, it is inducing a factorization where you have a marginal of one, and then a condition of two given one, in this case, in the other case, you have the opposite. So you have a marginal on two and then a conditional one given two. But what you can represent with one is exactly what you represent with the other. If you train those models using the same approach for training your maximum likelihood estimate from for, instance, for the parameters, you're going to get exactly the same joint in both cases. So the direction of the arc was completely unimportant in this case. And it is the unimportant in generating a Bayesian network. So this is a very important uh, point to make. It doesn't mean you can invert any arcs on the Bayesian network, okay? So that's not the case. That was how it continued also some of the discussions. If you have, for instance, what is called a V structure, so you have more than one parent in a node, that already makes it harder for you to invert this arc because, well, because if you invert it, actually the factorization will change in this case because this, one here, X3 has two parents, one and two, and then those two here are marginals. Imagine if you invert one of the arcs, you actually are changing the, cons the, the independent condition independence that are valid in that graph. While if you change the arc here, you are not changing. The set of conditional independences continues to be the same. That's why it's here, it doesn't matter. And here it matters. In some other cases, would not matter too. So that example is with two, but if you have uh, three of them in sequence like this, you could also make them in sequence in the other direction and you could represent the same model because all that this model is saying in terms of independences is that those two are independent when you observe, if you see this one here. Okay, and so it doesn't matter if they go this way or that way, what they mean is the same. So that's one point I wanted to mention. So um, in some sense, this is one of the reasons in the, the, the other slide I said, I kind of like more the undirected graphs in terms of explaining them because those kind of confusion does not happen there, but also there are these advantages on the undirected one. 
So with the directed one, one thing for me it's very nice is that I have a, a nice way of uh, sampling from this model. So it's a generative model and I can sample in the same direction of the arcs and this is natural. Uh, the, there is no problem of a normalization constant that I have to deal with later, like in the unnormalized. So there are benefits, but there are also disadvantages. So this is number one. Um, and I will assume that if you don't uh, uh, raise your hand, it's because it's fine. Okay, I will not keep asking if it's fine. So please uh, uh, make your best effort to be visible if you would like to say something, even if it's stop and say, no, it's not fine, or I don't understand. What are you doing there? Uh, what I'm doing here? All those questions leave for later because uh, it will take too long. Uh, code. So there was some code that I skipped, and uh, uh, we should go through because I'm going to use now for the credo networks to use as an example. So a little bit more in detail on the code that is there. Uh, it's quite repetitive, but what the code is doing is is creating a Bayesian network. And it does so by creating what we call the local, say, probability tables. They are the small tables, and the tables uh, are there for each variable given the parents. So that's why it's called CPT, usually because we just use this terminology. It's like a, a probability table. It's a conditional probability table. Uh, the first one that is created is for X1. X1 had no parents. So you see that the table has only two numbers because x1 was binary. So it's 0.7 for the true value, 0.3 for the false. And you have to say both of them here, even if obviously one should be one minus the other, but you have to tell both of them. And uh, just be below that, um, I apologize for those who are online, but I might use the pointer here and you might miss that. Um, I can use my mouse, but at some point, I, the pointer is much easier. When possible, I'll try to use the mouse for those online. So if you take for, uh, for X2, you have four values. Uh, that's because you need the conditional X2 given X1. So it is going to be a distribution for X2, for X1 equal to true, and another for X1 equal to false. X1 is the parent of X2. So if you look to this, that's why you have four numbers. So 0.1 and 0.9 are, it's one of the mass functions, and that is the mass function for when the parent x1 is true. And then you have the other, which is 0 0.3, 0 0.7. It's another mass function for when the parent is false. And that's why you have those four numbers. The order and how this is divided, you can see here the dimensions that you put on the table. If you don't work with R, it might look all a bit in, in encryption here, but it's just creating a table two by two with those two things inside. And it's one mass function for every value of the parent. That's what we have there. And the same thing for X3, because X3 also had, um, I'm confusing here now which mouse to use. X3 also has X1 as parent. So the same thing, we declare that X3 has X1 as parent on this line, and we use the four values. The first two are one mass function. The other two are the other one, and you have one for one X1 is true, and for other when x1 is false. Yeah? And you have the value true and false for the current variable x3. So we are just creating tables here. This is not uh, uh, yet uh, the, the, the structure. The x4 had two parents, and that's why you see eight values here. Okay, and because it had two parents, every two numbers is going to be one mass function, depending on the four joint configurations of the parents. The parents are x2 and x3. And by the way, you know this because it is written here in a, in a sort of text version. This is all from this BN learn package. Um, so that is declared who are the parents of whom in the, in the graph. Uh, so after all these uh, definitions, uh, we just uh, call the function that puts them together into what's called a, a network here. And it's a list with the distributions for each one. So basically, you take all the tables, you create a list of the tables, and you push into inside this function that gives you back uh, a class of the type Bayesian network uh, of this package being learned. And then you can use this uh, in the way you would like. In our case, we are using it with a function that uh, uh, 
Um, uh, it's available on the on the page that uh, is there uh, for you to play around. Uh, it's a function that is going through the computations with the, the Bayesian networks. And the result of the functions is what you see just under it. Uh, so you see what was the query. So in this case, we ask the probability of x2 equal to false, given nothing. That's why evidence is empty. And so this is what is the marginal probability of x2 uh, equal to false. To compute this in the network, we had to do some calculations there because we don't have the p of x2 in the network. All we have in the network is the p of x2 given x1. So we have to multiply that by x1, sum the values of x1, so marginalize that out to get the p of x2. That's what the code is doing, not in an efficient way, but is what is doing inside, right? If you want to compute the p of x2 in this case, you, all you need is to take the p of x2 given x1, multiply by x1, sum over the value of x1, and you get the p of x2. Now, just uh, basic probability rules there. And this is what the code here is doing, and it gets you a value. If you see there is log values and non-log, the log is because the, typically you use a, a, a log base because of numerical precision. Uh, that's the reason you have there but the actual value is 0.84, and you can check that in the network that the value is 0.84. And then I'm not going to go over all the, the different queries here. They are just examples that you can keep trying there with the code. The only one that is slightly different is that one. Uh, that query is not asking for computing the probability of something, an event, but is asking us, what is the configuration that has highest probability? So the network is still the same. And then the, the parameters there are what you have as, as an evidence. The last one is saying, I'm not wanting to give you anything. I just want you to give me the configuration of largest probability. And that is what you get back there. So the configuration of largest probabilities in this example would be x1 true and all the other three equal to false. And how much this joint configuration has as probability? 0.2835. That's what he said. It's the largest one among all of them. Okay? Is that uh, just like a bit of playing with our code? It's not uh, uh, that essential for the rest, but I thought it was important because when we do the example with Credo Networks, we are going to be using a SIM code that is very similar to that. So we can go to that. So Credo Networks. Uh, if you look at this slide, it was very similar to the slide I just had with Bayesian networks. Uh, but what we have now in each one of those local models is actually a set of mass functions instead of one mass function. So the difference we are moving, if you look even in the graph that is there on the right side, before there were like P of X1, now I'm writing K of X1 to represent that it is a set of P's. Okay, and in this example where everything is binary and everything uh, simple, what you have actually is an interval. Because if they are binary and set, uh, specified for a single variable, all you need is, is an interval to specify the credo set. You cannot, you cannot make a more complicated credo set even if you want it, if you just have a binary variable. Okay, all you have, okay, you could if they, that was not closed complex, but uh, a credo set closed and convex, all you need here is the intervals, the size, the sides of it, where it starts, where it ends for one of the values, because the other one is one minus. So that's what uh, we need to specify that credo set. Uh, obviously, in a general credo network, it doesn't need to be binary. So this could be uh, the K of X1 could be a complex set there. We are talking about uh, domains that are finite. So the number of possi the possible values of X1 is known. So basically, this is going to be a polytope, okay? For me here, could be a polytope. If X1 was not binary, could be a complicated polytope in a higher dimension. That's what we put there. And in, in this uh, lecture, I will focus on the case, what is called strong independence. So in the Bayesian network, there was this assumption, this Markov condition, and we said that the variables were independent of non-descendants given parents. Okay, that was a Markov condition that made possible for a Bayesian network to you know, break into pieces. For the credo network, we are going to use the same condition, apply it to extreme points of this uh, credo sets. 
if we use that same condition on the extreme points of the criddle set, that means that when we take any combination of extreme points of the criddle sets, that's actually one Bayesian network. So you could interpret this criddle network as a way of specifying many, many Bayesian networks. But I don't write down all the Bayesian networks. I, I write down small pieces that uh, could be intervals or polytopes. They have extreme values, the corners of it. And if I take any of those corners from each one of the credo sets, the one that is on x1 there, and the credo set that is on x2 given x1, for when x1 is true, there is one credo set. For when x1 is false, there is another credo set. On the same way I just explained, there was one mass function for parent true, one mass function for parent false. Same here, but not one mass function. A set of mass functions for when parent is true, a set of mass functions when parent is false. And the same thing goes in each one of the nodes. So you have lots of sets there. And if you take one extreme on each one of those sets, that forms one Bayesian network. So you can see that you can create many, many Bayesian networks by picking different extremes in each one of those uh, different sets. So it's a compact representation, compact because I'm not writing all the exponentially many ways that I could pick extreme points to create a, a Bayesian network. So exponentially many Bayesian networks represented in a compact way. Is that, uh, are, are we still together? Yeah. Uh, these extreme points are special set by the data way or how uh, yeah, so for now, let's say that uh, an expert told me. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, learning later on. Okay? So for now, let's just say that uh, 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 an expert came and gave me all these sets. Okay? He was a very good expert because actually it's quite hard. And you can ask Alessandro how hard it is to do a licitation of cradle sets. He's, he's the expert. Actually, I'm going to point to Alessandro many times during this talk. So every time I say expert, I mean Alessandro here, okay? So if, if you want to continue the discussion on that. Um, so it's, it's, it's clear what is this model that we are using here and, and how more powerful it is in terms of being expressive. Because uh, if you would like, you could take each one of these k's here and make it a singleton. So just one mass function inside, that is fine. And that will be one Bayesian network. So it's an extension of Bayesian network because uh, Bayesian network is a subcase of this. But there are many, many of them there inside. Yeah? So I will make lots of simplifications to make this uh, one hour and a bit uh, uh, easier for us. So I will assume that uh, the credo network that I have is all locally and separately specified and all the variables are binary. So what I mean by all those stuff, well, maybe it's nice to, to, to mention. Well, binary, I think you already guessed what it is. So the variables are just like true, false, uh, two possibilities uh, for each one of the variables. Locally means that uh, these credo sets are really specified inside each one of the variable given the parents and they don't involve anything else. And you say, yeah, but was that even allowed? Yes, I didn't tell you that was allowed. And I'm now saying it's not allowed. Okay, so I could have skipped it, but it's, uh, it's nice to bring this to your attention. Those credo sets, they are locally specified for a variable and the parents inside. You cannot put constraints or create uh, a polytope that involves variables that are disconnected there in the network. Okay, not allowed. Uh, they are separately specified. So again, what I explained before for you was already separated specified, but I think it's nice to tell what this means. When you have a variable and it has a parent, like x1, uh, x2 had x1 as parent, for each value of x1, true and false, I give you a credo set for x2. So you get two credo sets because x1, the parent, had two possible values, so the specification has two credo sets. This means that they are separated for each value of the parents or for each configuration of all the parts. And in this case, they could be not separated and there are cases for them not to be separated. Um, but if they are separated, we gain something on the computations. So for instance, 
higher dimension, you all you need for these examples here are intervals. For each one of the credo sets, actually, it's going to be an interval. I don't need to care about complicated polytopes because everything is, a, is an interval. Uh, so for every configuration of the parents, there is one interval there, and the value of the other is one minus what you get from this interval. So is it clear that actually my credo set is, can be specified by many, many intervals? It's you know, all these credo sets, but the credo sets are all intervals. I don't need more than intervals. I, can, I could even try, but the closer convex set is going to be an interval worse. Uh, so I'm saying this because the code that I'm going to use, which is a trick on implementation, uh, a dirt trick, is the following. I'm representing a credo network, which has exponentially many Bayesian networks inside by using only two Bayesian networks, but it's a trick. Follow me on the trick. I will create one Bayesian network with one of the extremes of the interval, another one with the other extreme. And so now I only need two Bayesian networks to represent exponentially many Bayesian networks. It's just a trick. I take two Bayesian networks. The number of one is, let's say, the lower value for the interval, and the one on the other is the upper value of the interval. And every credo set, I'm specifying on this trick. I will show you later the example. Maybe then it's easier, but it's just a trick for the implementation, okay, the, the, that I use. But before I get there, I must say that this now is constraining us. There would be other cases that would be nicer, like non-separated cases. Uh, an example of non-separated specified credo networks would be uh, qualitative uh, assessments. For instance, uh, in uh, qualitative reasoning, uh, it's uh, one common way to say that uh, a variable influences another is if that uh, uh, the in this case, Y influences X, if the probability of X is larger when Y is true than when Y is false. So you have the constraint there. So you can see that this is a constraint involving two different values for the parent set of X. Imagine that Y is the parent of X. So I'm saying that the probability of X is equal to true given Y true should be greater, me as an expert, than the probability of X is equal to true given Y false. But that's a different credo set. I cannot do that. I just told you that's illegal, okay? Because they are separately specified. But this would be nice to do if I could. We are not doing it today. But it's one of the things that uh, you could do with non-separated specified uh, credo sets, this type of qualitative reason. And also non-binary, it could be nice to have non-binary, but uh, the important thing also to mention is that non-binary can be translated to uh, equivalent binary representation with some tricks and non-local, uh, I'm sorry, non, uh, local non-separated specified can be, can be translated to separated ones. Um, so uh, you ask Alessandro if you want to know more about that. Okay, the, the, ask the expert about that. So even if I put in constraints, there is a way uh, that we can make any credo network satisfy those constraints that I'm telling you. So there are constraints, but they're not that bad. You can always end up with a credo network like that, right? Okay. What is the cost? Oh, that that is for the the the, the break. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm it's, uh, it doesn't explode, yes. Uh, I think if you use it later on smaller, but then can use it just two different methods, just one for the lower and one for the upper one. Um, I would expect that you have to. No, 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 actually, you're totally right. So it is just an implementation trick. I'm going to take the lower from one Bayesian network and the upper from the other, but I will combine in all possible ways. I'm not taking the Bayesian network as given as a Bayesian network. It's just a dirty trick. So the lower is here, the upper is there. But sometimes the upper is here and the lower is there because they have to sum one, otherwise they're not valid Bayesian networks. But it still is a nice trick uh, in terms of implementation. But it's really, uh, I, I get to, to, to that in a moment. So here is the, the credo network I'm going to create. The first one 
is the simplest one. And if you look to this slide, it's exactly the same slide as the Bayesian network. So I'm creating just one Bayesian network now. Very same thing, creating the tables on each one of, for each one of the nodes. And then I'm going to create a second one. So this is the specification of one of them. The CPTs for X1, for X2, X3, and X4, the diamond that we are looking with the temperature, the goalkeeper, attacker, and winning the game. It's, it's always the same example. And I'm going to create a second now, uh, Bayesian network. This Bayesian network though, has a different distribution, different mass function for X1. If you look there, I'm using one zero. So it means that has probability one for X1 equal to true, and probability zero for x1 equal to false. That's the one zero that you see there. The previous one was 0 0.7, 0 0.3. This one is one zero, okay? And now if you look on the bottom part, I'm creating two Bayesian networks. The first one, I use the CPTs of the previous slide. So CPT1, x1, CPT1, x2, CPT1, x3, CPT1, x4. The second Bayesian network, the only difference is for X1. I started with CPT2 X1. So they only have one difference, which is this distribution of X1 is different in one and in the other. So there are two Bayesian networks in this case that I created. And actually, because there is only one interval, one difference between them, there is also only two Bayesian networks in a credo network that I would try to specify using those two if I would play the game of taking extremes. So the networks, the only difference is that I'm specifying that the probability of X1 being true is between 0.7 and 1, because it was 0.7 in the previous slide, is 1 in this slide. So I created an interval using two networks. And we can continue doing that, and we can run inferences. Maybe, maybe we should run this uh, to see how many bugs we get uh, from my code. Uh, so I have a, a terminal here just with a, an R running directly on the terminal. And um, I have the files open somewhere here. So this is not it. This is not it either. No, it's also not that one. Uh, that's one of them. Uh, I will copy and paste. Uh, this is the second part. And we also need, which you also can, Wait, just a second, this is very important. <laughs> and you also can take from here uh, any of the files. So just as an example here, this is the BN1. And what you can do, so long as you have installed the packages that you need, like BN Learn, right? You can copy this uh, to your R console or whatever way you like to use R. And if you don't like to use R, uh, I know it's not your fault. It's quite boring sometimes. But uh, you can just copy it here and, uh, well, type enter here, it just run. It doesn't do anything because I just created many variables. But if you want to look one of them, CPT1X1, then it has the values inside. If you want to look to CPT4, the tables are there, right? That, that's, that's all it's there. So the tables, the tables we were creating, they were there inside. And, um, what we are going to do then is to take the thing that I had on the slide there, which creates the two networks. So this is the, the, the code to create the two networks that we just saw on the slide. And I'm also going to copy it here. So at this point, now I have two networks is net one and net two. We can also type to see what this is, but it's going just to dump to you all the tables of the, of the Bayesian network. So that's what it's showing when I, 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 I dump it to here. And then there are queries that we can run here. So if you take a look on those, we are going to make queries, but it is a, it is a credo network. So what does it mean to make a query now at this point? Because if I had a Bayesian network and I ask the probability of, uh, let's see what is what's in here. Let's grow this a bit, because it's a bit small, too much. Um, I'm asking here that I want to query the value of uh, variable true to be false there. And uh, the first line is saying, create a query vector O empty with an A's, uh, put the names, so they have names, they look nice, uh, put the value of, of true equal to false, and then call the inference method that uh, I, I, I created there. 
and he gives the answer to us. And then do the same, but with a second query. What the code is going to give us uh, after we run this, some, uh, some debugging and then uh, an interval. The query P of X2 equal to false, given nothing because that was what I asked for, is an interval between 0.84 and 0.9. Uh, and the second query that was here, it was the P of X1 true and X2 false, and that was an interval 0.63 to 0.9. Why those are intervals? Well, I told you that this represents multiple Bayesian networks. So what the code does is that it takes all the, each Bayesian network and then get a result and uh, compute then the maximum, the minimum. So why? Because, well, you have a set of Bayesian networks. Which one is the correct? Well, I don't know, there is no correct. All you can give you is an interval. The lowest possible value you can get for the probability of X2 equal false and the largest possible value, depending on the Bayesian network you use, right? So you get an interval in the end. Is all that clear? Okay, there is one thing here that I didn't tell yet. This code I'm using is approximate, so uh, it's really like the simplest possible code. So if the results don't match what you expect, it's just because uh, of that. Okay, so I don't do all the optimization that is needed to solve a credo network precisely. I just do a sampling of Bayesian networks. So if you open the code, you're going to see that it's a very dirty code. The code takes the following approach because there are exponentially many Bayesian networks and I don't want to try all of them because it takes a lot of time. I sample Bayesian networks and I keep sampling Bayesian networks and I report it to you the maximum and the mean. It's a terrible approximation, but let's go with it. Uh, since the objective here is not having the exactly correct number, okay? You can do better than that. You can use uh, Alessandro's software. So it's, you always ask Alessandro, okay? So my question is related to that. Uh, are there any exact methods to get this bound? Yeah, that exists. Uh, exist. Uh, they scale poorly if you have very large networks. They work pretty well for small networks. What we have, which scales very well for very large, is very good approximation methods. And they give you very good intervals. So if you really want to use this in large scale, that's what I would suggest. A good approximation method, not mine, huh? not, this, not this sampling thing, like serious approximation stuff that uh, the, the group there in Lugano have created some. There are others, not just them, but uh, uh, it's easy for me to just point, keep pointing to them, okay? <clears throat> Um, so yes, so there are methods that are exact, there are methods that approximate. I also created my own exact methods in the past. Um, it, it is an exponentially number of Bayesian networks. It's a hard problem to solve. Inferences in Bayesian networks are already hard, and credo networks are even harder, but the approximate methods are pretty good. That would be the message I would, uh, I would tell. So I think that we already know a lot about credo networks. I think I have some slides about it that maybe I should skip because we already know how to compute inferences with it. So this is the slide maybe I should skip. So you already know how to do it. Uh, how do I compute something with a credo network? So the top is actually the Bayesian network we saw before. Uh, there is a complicated function, uh, which you can be smarter by exchanging sums and products and, and doing calculations, but I'm skipping the how, how to do this in the most efficient way today. We just do it in a certain way. For the Bayesian network, my code is actually exact, but it's just exponentially bad. For the credo, what we do is computing minimum and maximums. Here is the example of minimum. So besides all the complications of that, we still have a mean to do over all the possible Bayesian networks, if you want the mean or the max. And this code of mine is even worse than that. So that is exactly what approximate, this is in approximate, it's just really a sampling, but it's worth to have something like that just for us to play, it's fast enough to see some results. Um, we have some other examples going on here, but that is basically what the credo network is as a, repre as a representation model, is this set of Bayesian networks under strong uh, 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 independence. So there are other types of, uh, of credo networks. I'm not going to go in all the, the, the variations and types because we don't have time, uh, but we will use this one for, for, for classification. So uh, to have an idea on how it can be useful. 
uh, as, a, as a model for classification, okay? So this is a first, uh, well, a second example. We already did one, but ours was very simple and one and now a bit more complicated. You have credo sets everywhere. So you can see that uh, each one of the nodes is defined by an interval. And this matches with what I was defending to you before that all you need is the, are the intervals. And you have one interval for every configuration of the parts. And I'm only showing the interval for the value that is true of the variable, because for the false, you just do one minus. So the complement interval for the false is not on this slide, okay? So this is just, uh, it's complete in terms of specification. So all the three parameters are here, but, uh, but if you want to, any false, you have to do one minus. It's, it's not in the slide. And here is the specification of the, the joint credo set. It's just basically telling exactly what I said before. Pick configurations, extremes everywhere, and combine all extremes, and then uh, put them all together. So if you would, you could see this credo network as, well, one way is a set of Bayesian networks. Uh, depending on what you pick, you'll get one. Another way of looking to that, which is representing on this very high dimension, the joint one, is a very big polytope, if you take this convex rule of this thing. Okay, so it's, it's just, we don't want to write it down, but that's what it is. When I started working on this, I had no idea exactly what this was. This was uh, 2001, I think 2001. So 21 years ago, I started working on this and Fabio was here, he was my supervisor. He said, oh, we are trying to solve this problem here. Can you run this thing and I'll try to, to find the, the, the credo set that represents this model. At that time, we used CDs. Uh, do you know what is a CD? I guess so, right? But you don't use it because yeah, it's too old. But I had a few CDs just to write down all the extreme points of the credo set that we were working, which was the result of a credo network. We had some billions of points and we used a linear programming thing to keep enumerating all of them and then, and then writing down on CDs. Um, I don't even remember for why we did that. Maybe he just wanted to make me work for, you know, learn that things are hard. But uh, no, there was a better motive than that. Let's not, uh, Fabio's probably listening, by the way. Um, so uh, I don't remember anymore for what was. But anyway, the credo network then, my message is that this credo network actually has a, a credo set there on this high dimension that you could potentially take all the extreme points and write them down, but they are going to be really, really a lot. Uh, and well, as an experiment, you, there are ways of trying that. Okay, but we don't want, in practice to keep writing down that. It, it's, just, uh, it's just too much. Um, so I have code for this example. And in this case, the two networks are very different. So you have the uh, CPT one for, uh, oh yeah, let me talk about here. You have a, a small case, smoker, uh, and then uh, a margin for smoker, then cancer, uh, probability of cancer given smoker. Then you have the probability of bronchitis given smoker. X-ray, for each of X-ray being true or false, so detecting or not cancer, given cancer. And then the spinia given cancer and, and, and locates. So this is the example. And then I'm specifying the trick, two Bayesian networks. One here is the CPT1 and the other CPT2. So for smoke, you have two, and those you can see as the uppers and lowers. Then for lung, you are going to have four numbers because they are two mass functions depending on the value of the parent. And you can look to this as one extreme and this as the other extreme of the set. That's why you have two Bayesian networks and you can look those as the two extremes of the set. Okay, so that's where the interval is if you are thinking about. So that's my trick of representing intervals. I keep writing them down and then um, Eventually we finish that, we can create the two networks. So the networks are here. And after you create the networks, you can make queries with the network, like uh, maximum and lower probabilities. I'm, uh, I'm not going to do that just because you can run. Uh, and there is nothing new compared to the previous example, but I put here so you can see the, the, the gist of uh, computing uppers and lowers with this code. And the examples continue here, okay? There are a few more examples on computing uppers and lowers. Um, so that is what it is about uh, uh, 
the basic case of credo networks. Let's uh, try to use them to, to solve some problem with this. So for what we can use a credo network? So I will use the naive credo classifier, which is a simple credo network. But before that, I have to mention to you just quickly a way of learning this from data because uh, uh, it's not always that we can get an expert that will specify all the, the intervals. So one possible way of learning from data, um, and in here I'm going to assume that you are doing this separately for every credo set. You already know this structure. I'm not learning this structure. You have this structure or the expert gave you this structure. And you're going to learn the credo set for each one of the credo sets that you need there inside of this big credo network. So take one of them, okay? And imagine that is this for the variable X. If it had parents, it would be for the, a certain specification of the parents, or you just think this is the, the marginal one. Then you want to learn this. So let's say that you would do maximum likelihood estimate. Typically, you would just take uh, frequencies from the data, how many times X appeared in the data, divided by the, the total the number of data. You can take a multinomial uh, Dirichlet uh, approach, and then you have this uh, formula uh, with S here in, in, in many papers, uh, name it as the equivalent sample size, is the strength of the prior. You can also uh, look like that. And T, X, is the location of the prior. So S the strength, TX the, the location. And it's very common to take TX as a, as a, as a uniform uh, distribution, uh, but you don't have to, right? But uh, that's a very common approach to take TX there as a uniform. If you look on the triangle, the maximum likelihood is the white dot. I know your eyes are amazing, so you can see the white dot. And the green dot is the, the uh, Bayesian, I think, with S1, if, if, I, if I remember properly. Um, and if you could do it in an imprecise way, using what is called the imprecise division model, and in this case, what you get is an interval for every value of every possibility of X, and you get this interval by allowing TX to vary from any possible distribution. So the TX are going to go all the way from zero to one as a value for every one of the x's. In this case, x assumes three possible values, draw, loss, or win, and tx, which is a distribution, that's the three numbers, they can go all the way around, okay? So the whole uh, simplex. And if you can make tx go all the way around, what is the minimum you can do with it? It's zero. So in this case, you get to this, if tx goes to zero. You take that formula, tx goes to zero, by the way, there is a typo there because uh, there is not plus X on the denominator of the Bayesian one. Uh, there should be a, a, a plus X there, uh, plus S on the denominator. Okay, just like here. So if you take that formula and you imagine there is a plus S in the denominator, okay, then this is the minimum you can get. That's the maximum you can get when TX goes to one. Okay, this TX is the, the location of your, of, of your prime. So you get the intervals for each one of the X. If you get the intervals, you get the a credo set in the end. If it's binary, it's just one interval and that's it, which is the uh, case of the examples we, we looked at before. And uh, obviously if N grows, then this uh, shrinks, uh, but it's exactly to represent that then you have more knowledge. So this is a nice thing. And the amount of value you put on mass is exactly this weight of how fast you want this to shrink or how slow you want this to, to shrink. Could be seen like that, right? So that's the imprecise Dirichlet model that can be used to learn these credo sets from data. They will give intervals that are induced by this. Uh, uh, you not having to choose your prior, or not to have to choose the location of your prior, just the strength of your prior. As the strength, you have to still choose uh, here. Uh, we, will we will do a way that you don't have to choose even that, but uh, it comes in a moment. So estimates are uh, imprecise, upper and lowers. Um, they do not depend on, on the sample space, what is not so important in my discourse here, but nice to put there. Um, and the gap narrows as you have more data. So the naive base classifier, which you might have already seen around or used, it, is a classifier of the most simple type, I would say. You have a, it's a, it's a credo network. It's a credo network where you are interested on guessing the value of C, which is a root node, 
and every one of the other variables are uh, direct uh, child of C. So that's the, the graph structure of the, the NI base. And we can learn NI base using the IDM, for instance, that we just discussed, it, and then get a, a, a NI base model. And how we issue a classification with NI base? Well, you can compute the probability of a certain class given the other variables, the features that you see by just using the factorization. The factorization tells us in the night base that every feature is independent of the others given C. So you have a big product with, uh, with the probability of F given C for every one of the features F and the probability of C, the margin of C there. And then if you use uh, uh, the uh, IGM to learn, what you have as an estimate for P of C and for P of each one of the F is given C is the formula we just saw in the previous slide with the caveat that T can go all over the board. T can go everywhere. So you're going to end up getting a complicated sets here or intervals, okay? When you allow T to keep varying, that's the idea. And what is nice of this is that we can now by varying t, get actually a credo network. The credo network is going to give an interval. And then if the interval of the, a certain class is always, the probability of certain class is always higher than the other classes, then what is the meaning of that? It means basically that doesn't matter which prior you pick, prior location, as strength you, you show of the prior, as you show, but prior location you didn't. Doesn't matter what prior you pick location, you get the same class. If the interval of one class, it's always above the interval of another class. There will be intervals because we know we are varying T, so we get intervals. But it could be that in some cases, those intervals are split from each other. And then you could say, oh, this is an easy case because uh, even if I wouldn't choose the prior location, I always get the same solution, or this is always the best solution for a certain uh, item that I want to classify. So if you, if, if you are still with me, what we are doing here somehow is having an extra information about the classification. You can issue a classification, but more than that, you can be more certain of it because even if you have picked the location of the prior anywhere, you would still get to the same conclusion. That's the, the, the key behind it. So uh, what we often do with this in, in, in classification is to separate instances where we may call safe instances from others. Safe here meaning they don't depend on the location of the prior. If you issue a classification, it's always the same. Wherever you put the location of the prior, then this is kind of like a classification that I'm more confident to be correct uh, because I didn't have to choose the location of the prior and the result does not change the, regardless of where I put the prior the location of the prior. Uh, but there are other cases, right? There are other cases where, depending on T, where T would be, the location of the prior, I might end up with one class or another class, or that case, then I don't know which one is the correct class. That's fine. So you could just give to me a set of possible classes, those that are among the best ones, or non-dominated, as it's called here. But those are cases we say that the classification is indeterminate, or we cannot exactly tell. And so there is, a, there is this criteria, and a typical criteria that we could use uh, to tell which are the good classes is the following. If a class C prime uh, satisfies this equation, the probability of C prime given the features is greater than the probability of C double prime given the features. Over all possible models, Bayesian networks you have, then, I always prefer C prime and never C double prime. So I could say C double prime is no good. C prime is always better. But there are some cases that I end up with a few different, and C, C primes here are guesses, right? To the class that I'm trying to, to guess. Some cases I might end up with a, a single guess or sometimes with a set of guesses. Those that I cannot uh, uh, tell if it's better or, or, or worse than other because there is some Bayesian network that this is better, there is some other Bayesian network inside my grid where this other is better. So it's in some way a robustness or sensitivity of, uh, of the results that we are looking at. Um, let's look to an example here. Uh, it's about uh, recognizing uh, textures. And it had uh, uh, four and a half thousand images and 24 different things, classes to guess. Uh, 
so the type of texture. And uh, there is some idea there to collect features, which was related to the proximity and difference of colors in the texture. We don't need to go to those details. Just trust me, some features were created to try to do this classification. And you could guess many, many classes. So there are many types of textures that you could guess. And then if you take a naive base classifier, a standard knife base, not a credo one, you get already a currency of 92%, which is pretty good on, on here, okay? But coolest on the table is, is, is what you get here uh, on the accuracy. If you look to the uh, difference when you take the credo version and you take the cases where the credo version had only one class that was non-dominated, uh, so doesn't matter which Bayesian network would pick, the credo classifier would always say the same thing over all the Bayesian networks that are there inside the model. So it doesn't matter where your prior would be, you would still give me the same answer. This is this column, is the safe column, okay? That column, the second one, is telling me what is the accuracy when the classifier was in doubt. Sometimes it said one class, sometimes it said another class. Look, this is per instance, that's very important because I was always confused when somebody was telling me about this story. I was confused with the fact that, uh, what do you mean by multiple classes, one class? Yeah, so this is done object per object. So take one of those and you want to guess the class of this, okay? Run a credo classifier for this because the credo classifier has many Bayesian networks inside. It might be the credo classifier says the answer is A or B. Why? Because the intervals of A and B were overlapping, so I don't know if it's better B or better A, better B. There are some cases, others, take another from the pack on this one. It could be that the credo classifier for all the Bayesian networks inside always says, oh, this is definitely B. Doesn't matter which Bayesian network pick, it's B. This is what we call safe. And see that this is done per instance. So here is the accuracy over the instances that the credo classifier by itself defined that they are safe. So you don't know, you don't need to know the answer, the correct answer to know if it is deemed as safe or not by the credo classifier. This is done without knowing the correct answer. So you can use that information even without knowing the truth. So the credo classifier got 94% on those cases. And also, it deemed 95% of the data to be safe. So basically, over all the things that I needed to classify, only 5% the credo classifier said it was not safe. All this 95% said it's safe, and you got an accuracy very high, 94% there, which is obviously above the 92 there. Those are the, the, the safe case, the easy cases in some sense. Those are the hard cases, but it's still surprisingly high, the accuracy, because I had so many options. And in average, the classifier only selected 2.4 options among all the 20 options it had there. So even when it is not safe, it still did a pretty good job to pick among those that was guessing the correct one. And that is what is called set accuracy here. So even on those really tough instances where it doesn't know exactly, there were 20 something options. It didn't know what is the correct, but it gave you like two or three options. And in 85% of the time, the correct one was among these two or three options. That's what the table is telling. Okay, so it's, a, it's kind of like pumping up, like boosting your classification. Obviously, if you get two, three options, what you do with that? Uh, you have to decide among those. Maybe you flip a coin, maybe you run another classifier. I'm not going to enter into that, but this is still very impressive. Um, so are there cases where the prior, there's a way higher proportion of prior dependencies? This slightly correctly would seem worth all the other So Something slightly above, we more actually five times the case that there is. That's a, a good point. I will, for today, avoid the debate if this 2% is, that's what you're saying, right? 94 is just a little bit above 92. Uh, I will avoid the discussion on whether it's important in this particular example, but I think that they conclude it was. 
Um, but you are totally right. So how much of uh, more computational power and effort I, I, I'm willing to pay to get a little bit? It's a very good point. But I, 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 please allow me to avoid that discussion right now. But it's, we always have to consider that. I, I, I'm totally with you on this. So sometimes we, we might say, okay, the accuracy is already good enough, I'm not doing that. But in some other cases, maybe if you're you know, very risky and you're risk averse, then you do everything you can, even if you have to spend more. So it's, it's a balance there, there is a trade-off. Thanks for that. So um, what I wanted to say to conclude this part is that um, you, it, this kind of thing is not an, this idea of like trying to discover if you're doing a good job or not, it's not a new thing, right? These are probabilistic models, the naive base is a probabilistic model. You could have taken the probability that naive base gives us output for the largest class as the probability value and use that as your confidence, right? I mean, it's a probability. So I'm saying that the answer here is A, and I'm saying uh, is A because the probability of A given the features is 97%. But who is saying it's 97%? The, the naive base classifier is saying it's 97%. So I could say the following. Every time the naive base tells me that the, the largest, the class with largest probability has very high probability, I call that safe. And every time it says, oh, this is the best class, but the probability is 0.7 or 0.6 or even 0.3 because there are 20 something. The largest might have probability 0.3. Then I say, okay, no, this is not safe. So I could put a threshold on the probability value to define what is safe and not safe and do the same trick. So let's throw away the credo one and just put a threshold on the probability of the precise one. Well, what they concluded there, it's what was most important here in the middle, half of those that were prior dependent in that example have a very high probability uh, as uh, issued by the naive uh, 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 classifier. And that is a known problem, problem or characteristic of a naive classifier. Maybe not all classifiers, but naive classifiers tend to be very aggressive, like very high probabilities and very low probabilities because of this independence assumption that is there. So usually probabilities are not good to separate what is safe or not, at least for the naive classifier. The, the credo does a better job. That's the, the, the message here that I'm going to just quickly mention. Um, and then there is a question that um, we keep asking ourselves here and that is it uh, and all these schools and every year after year, we keep asking the same thing. Um, what if you need an answer? So I'm saying to you, there are 20 something options. And then I have an amazing classifiers, all gets right, never makes mistakes, but sometimes it says it's A or B. I don't know, it's not of the others, but uh, it's A or B. And it stops there, it doesn't tell you more. So should you then not use a credo classifier because you need a, a precise uh, value? And then the, my answer is no, you should still use something like this if you, if you have a risk situation, obviously. Then uh, what do you do? Well, try to run a different uh, classifier or ask the expert, right? In many cases, for instance, uh, in the medical domain, uh, you can quickly screen off things that are definitely not plausible and then ask the doctor about those more plausible or an expert on the X-ray. Uh, radiologist or so. So there are many things you can do or even use a different model over those cases that are hard or do active learning. So my point here is a cue for active learning. Uh, in one, a couple of sentences. So the idea of active learning is you pay to see the label of some instances, right? Which instances you want to see the label? Are those that are you are most undecided? So run your credo plus fire uh, if the credo classifier already guesses a single thing, maybe you don't want to know that instance. You want to know an instance when it is very uncertain. Uh, so there are many combinations of this that you can use in practice, uh, but I do recognize uh, that uh, if you go out there, often you're going to hear, but I want an answer. I want a, I want a single answer. And uh, sometimes you're going to have to figure out how to give a single answer. 
So we did that, for instance, which worked very well. It was, we cascaded cladal classifiers one after the other, but changing them as you go to be more specialized on some types of instances. So we ran a cradle classifier. The cradle classifier is very certain about some of them, about some of the objects. Okay, classify them. For the others, it's not. So we have a second cradle classifier who is very certain about some of those, but not others, and keep going. And actually, these improved results often up to five to 10 credo classifiers that you would be using, you would get better results than using uh, fewer of them or just one uh, in, in the very beginning. So there are many ideas that you can use to put this together if you need to get to a, to a answer. Yes. Um, in this regard, for you, you know how this parameter S is there and whether the team of S matters for the actual team of person. Yes, so um, it's uh, it's one of the points where you still need a, a, a tuning. By tuning, I mean maybe an expert. I don't mean necessarily like a, a train validation test and so. Uh, if you would do that, it would kind of go against uh, some of the, the let's say, more uh, um, uh, hardcore principle subjective values because you are tuning the prior. Um, so yes, it is a it is a thing that you have to decide. But I will uh, in the second part talk about a way that you would run about without having to choose S, which is a more uh, sensitivity analysis of results. So you start with a precise model, and then you perturb it. And in that case, you don't need to choose the value fast because you're not training directly. But if you're training, yeah, you, you need to call a sender. He, he can choose the, the, the value for you. <laughs> but it is, it, is, it, is, it is based on the, the task. Right? It, it is, it's the same as, as uh, asking a, a data scientist or a statistician on, you know, you have to see the problem and take some decisions. We cannot you know, clean up all the decisions. Some of them we need a person there, but that's my opinion at least. It's a bit against the typical machine learning right now, but uh, sometimes we need a person to say something. Um, okay. uh, the, in, in the cascading version, I'm thinking of it as like sort of graphing in the sense you run the first one and it's the thing that you solve. Yeah. The training of the secondary and tertiary classifiers, are those then traditional or are they? Yeah, so um, we, the, the, the results I mentioned, it was unconditional. So I would assume this prospect for improvement by using a traditional classifier, given that you're accepting the, uh, uh, the, the fact that the first classifier would then able to say yes. So you're saying it's not this. I, I, I think so too. I think there is lots of room for improvement on this idea of cascading. And I think it's uh, what you need is, at least in our experience, what was essential is to, is to move away from the classifier you had into something very different because you have to see the data in a different way. It could be by a conditional version or by a different type of, a completely different type of analysis. Uh, that that we took that approach. So we use a different types of classifiers, uh, and uh, well, it, it, it's uh, empirically shown on ensemble methods that uh, they can help each other. So like uh, um, uh, bootstrapping or or things that you look to the, the data in a different way, uh, and we could do also the conditional way. Uh, we didn't try; it was not our, the, the way we tried. Uh, we didn't try just because. Um, for doing the um, conditional way, we have to assume that the data is given to us as a batch, and we were assuming that you get, you, you get every instance, one at a time, as an online thing. To do the, the conditional, you would need the batch because you need to train over those that you don't know. So there is also the constraint on how the, 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 the domain is, but that's a very good point, thanks. Um, so I do have uh, some code here. Uh, I started, I, I have 23 minutes, right? Yes. 
And I do have some code here for the to, to show you this. Um, to show this in practice. And basically what I have on the code, which I'm going to run to the end here, it's a, a very simple uh, credo network using the graph that was fixed. And in this case here, I'm not even training with the intervals, but I'm contaminating. And what the code shows is that uh, the accuracy when you say a single thing, when the accuracy when you say multiple things is, is clearly different. And you, when you say a single thing, you always do, do much better. But this will appear also a conclusion of slides that I will show you. So I will not run the code. Uh, you can try to run the code and see the, the results there. And I will improve a bit those these codes with more comments as, as we go. But for now, I will, uh, um, in view of time, I will continue with the uh, final topic that I wanted to mention, because I think it would be a pity not to mention this uh, other type of model. Uh, it's a model where the credo version is almost as efficient as the non credo version. And uh, this gives us, uh, you know, one of the problems that often uh, we are criticized if you take a credo network and you want to use compared to a Bayesian network is that it's computationally more intense, way more intense. It's not the case here for this type of model. I'm calling it some product networks in the slide. Uh, nowadays, people are using probabilistic circuits as the, as the most common terminology for that. Uh, but it's a different type of model. It, it goes in parallel with credo networks, but it's not a credo network. Actually, we are trying to figure out the relations uh, with credo networks, aren't we? Okay. Um, so <laughs> uh, the difference of this model to the credo networks is that uh, it's way closer to a, a neural net. And that's why also I would like to spend this 20 minutes we have on this different type of model. How is close to a neural net? So a Bayesian network, the graph of a Bayesian network is a graph which has an interpretation on conditional independences. So I call this actually interpretable. I don't like to call explainable, and I make I draw the distinction on uh, explainability as needing a target to someone I need to explain this. And when I say interpretable, what I mean is that there is there is a very clear, easy to tell mathematical reason for why the graph has this and what are the properties there. And the Bayesian network has this. You can read all the, the independence, the condition independence on the graph. Okay, so there is an interpretation for the graph. Here, the interpretation is computation. So the graph follows a circuit where you compute numbers with the other numbers. And it's pretty simple. There are two types of, three types of nodes. One is sum, meaning that you take from your children the values, you do a weighted average or a weighted sum, and you push that up if you are a sum node. If you are a product node, you take the values from your children, multiply them, and pump up. So there are just two computations, and then there are the, the, the leaves, those that start down there. And in my example, they are just indicator functions. So they are just pushing up either a zero or a one, depending if it matches with uh, the query that you make and nothing else. So this is a circuit of computations. There is an interpretation with uh, latent variables and the paths and so I'm not going to have time to go there, but there is a context specific independence interpretation for the paths on this graph, but it's very hard to read. And this has now 10-ish uh, years since it was proposed, and it was proposed with some you know, reasonable results on, on images or completing images of faces. Uh, the idea is that uh, under some very simple assumptions, it, it specifies a, a joint distribution for a set of variables. If the leaf nodes are those indicator functions, which just send zero or send one, and as I said, you have other two types of nodes, weighted sums and uh, products. Uh, the trick here is that for the product, when you do product, what comes, so the variables that are in each side should be disjoint. 
So you never multiply x with x. You multiply p of x with p of x. You always multiply p of x with p of y. So it has this taste of independence. Uh, so this is the, the property you need on the, the product node. And on the sum node is that all the children cover the same variables. So that's a flavor of uh, a mixture model. And that's all it is. So it's a mixture model with these product nodes that allow you to have some independences that are context specific because they are in different parts of this big circuit. But if you look at it, it's just a big circuit. We assume the weights to be normalized because that gives you a normalized probability in the end, but you could normalize them anytime you want. So it's, it's not really a restriction. Uh, so this is what I said, there is this implicit latent variable and that's the idea, it's, it's kind of like a mixture model that you have. Um, so the, the graph in this case of some product nodes is just really a circuit you do computations. Neural networks are a circuit you do computations. So it's pretty much the same, but typically they don't use product nodes. Uh, they use the sum nodes and they use other activation functions, nonlinear activation functions. In this case, we don't use them, but you use the product nodes with these properties of the product node. So it's, it's close enough. Actually, you can run this code using the same uh, libraries for neural nets. You can use your preferred library of Keras or PyTorch or something and, and run these models inside with all the parallelism and GPUs and, and so on, as long as your structure allows you. So it, you have a, a quite structured model. Uh, we have an example here, a computation with it. Uh, so let's say you want to compute the P of A equal to true. That's what the one means there. Uh, notation is not so great, but that's what it means. So what do you do for this case? Because you want A equal to true and you didn't say anything about B, on the indicators of B, you put one in all of them. And on the indicators of A, you put zero on those that contradict what you want and one on those that uh, are, uh, agree with what you want. After you do that, propagate or compute it, okay? If it is product multiply, if it's sum, do the weighted sum. And then when you get to the end there, you have that number, and that is the P of A equal to true. 0.45 in this example, if you just keep computing up. So it's very efficient, it's linear time computation, you get the probability of uh, any instantiation, including marginals if you see here. This is already the marginal of A because this is a joint distribution for A and B. And you, I just got the marginal of A, which is another property of this. You get marginals efficiently, you get joints, conditionals, and so on. A precise model, there is no imprecision here yet. But uh, that's the cool thing, is a probabilistic model as a circuit, just as like a neural network is, though a neural network is not a probabilistic model in the same sense, where each node has a probabilistic interpretation. In this case, you can take any node, even the middle ones, there is a probabilistic interpretation for each one of those nodes, okay? So uh, this is a nice thing. You can make it credo. And I will make it, uh, uh, well, first of all, to make it credo, what one possibility that you can do is take the weights of a sum node, instead of interpreting that as a vector with the weights for each one of the children, take that vector now, instead of having one vector, have a set of vectors, a polytope of vectors with the extremes, if you will. What does this give to you? Same interpretation of the critical network. Every time you pick one of those vectors from a set of vectors, if you do that for every sum node that is a weighted sum, you get one SPN. If you have this sets of vectors everywhere, you have an exponential number of SPNs represented by this critical SPN. So same analogy of, uh, of the credo network, but with this circuit. So that's uh, uh, the idea of the model, is the definition of the model. Uh, nice thing that we have here is that if you want to do computations with it on the credo version, computing upper probabilities, lower probabilities, because you have now a set of recipients, you're going to get uppers and lowers, not fixed values. It all runs in, Linear time does, or quadratic most. Actually, you can do even n log n uh, with tricks on implementation. But let's say it's, even if it's quadratic, okay, this is pretty fast. So the original SPN is linear, and all the credo versions, the most complicated ones we use, are at most quadratic. And typically, quadratic is really a, 
uh, uh, Zlecki bound. It's, it's, it's much better than that. So you are getting all these exponentially many SPNs without costs, or almost without costs, very little costs. How we use this? Well, one way that we have used them is to do the critical classification justice with the naive that we did. Um, but a way more powerful model than the naive credo classifier. By the way, the naive credo classifier is also very efficient, but that is not true for every credo network, right? Complexity gets higher as you have more complex networks. Here, no, you can have huge uh, SPNs, and it's still uh, subquadratic, uh, the complexity to run credo classification. And then you can do the very same thing that I already explained to you before. You can take different classes and you can say that one dominates the other or one is better than the other if the probability of one is always greater than the other. So, and then you discard the same domination principle that I explained before. You can do here. Uh, you can do this computation with SPNs. Uh, and we have done that. So, we took some digits. Uh, that's a very simple, small data set, just as a, as a proof of concept. We have done with much bigger ones. Uh, and uh, I will have a few minutes to mention those. Um, and what, what we did here is a little bit different in terms of training. We didn't train the model with the IDM, imprecise prediction model, where the intervals are induced from data, right? So based on data, you get the intervals. Here, we didn't do that. We trained a precise model, one SPN, and then we enlarge it so we train one SPN, you're going to have weights, fixed weights everywhere. Now we enlarge those weights by expanding a set around your fixed weights that you learn with a precise learner, whatever precise learner you want to use. There are a few in the market you can take from the shelf. How did we enlarge? What is called an epsilon contamination. So basically we are enlarging in a way that is not really a ball, but is in a way that grows equally fast in the direction of all the sides of your simplex, if you want to do an interpretation of that. It's actually a quite nice way of enlarging because when you get to the full enlargement, you get exactly the whole simplex. And then when you reduce, you get to the exactly point. That's why it grows faster to the sides that is farthest away and is lower to the sides that are closer. So you get the full set. Yes. Um, not really, because we are enlarging the parameters of the model and we are not touching the data. I have actually one slide about uh, uh, attacking models and the data thing. Uh, I hope I get to that. Uh, thanks for, for that. It's a very good point. So, but here we are enlarged, we are enlarging and, and changing the parameters of the model. So it's really a sensitivity analysis of the model itself. And uh, what we did was uh, take cases where you classified correctly and take cases where you classified wrongly. So we split on those after checking the results. So we need we, we knew if we got right or got wrong. That's what's correct and wrong means. And what the columns have is how much I was able to enlarge up to the point that my model was not safe anymore. Remember, safe means in, in, the, in our example is that the model is answering more, is indeterminate. It doesn't know anymore if the class is A or B. So I keep enlarging. When I have a single model, the guess is always a single guess because there is uh, apart from ties, but let's assume there are no ties. So the guess is only a single guess, but if I have a credo SPN, it may be that some SPNs say A and some others say B. So I enlarge up to the point, all of them still say the same thing. I stop exactly in the moment that uh, some of them are starting to go to say something else. That's where I stop enlarging. So for the correct ones, we could enlarge way more than for those that we were wrong. Meaning that, uh, we could almost tell when we are right or wrong. If this number is high, it's probably you are right. If this number is low, it probably uh, is, is low. More chance that we are wrong. And this number can be computed without knowing the correct. Here, the analysis I know, so that's why I split. But the enlargement does not depend on knowing the correct answer. It just depends on my model is saying a single thing or is in doubt among different things, right? Not about being right or wrong. So, 
Um, there is here a, a summary about this uh, uh, Credo SPNs. And I have a few slides about what I think is this moment the most promising, although we are already moving forward even further on this. But this is a type of SPN, which I think is very promising. And I will only spend a few minutes here just to tell you that random forests are actually an SPN and you can make them generative by just taking a, a tree, like decision tree, translating to an SPN. And if you take your random forest with all your trees, translate all of them to these circuits, you have a very big circuit and you get all the characteristics of the circuit is still with the same properties that you had on your random forest. So if you like a random forest model, you should try this generative version. The results are the same if you don't have missing data, for instance. If you have missing data, it has a proper treatment of missing data because it has a joint distribution, while a random forest has a distribution for y given x, the given x is the path that you follow in each one of the decision trees. This model has actually a joint for x and y. So you can compute marginals of the model and you can do missing data properly. Um, you can do outlier detection by looking to likelihoods, uh, mar missing data by marginalizing what you don't see. And you can do no mar missing data by asking Alessandro. Um, I hope you get lots of questions later. I'm trying a lot here. See the, 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 but, but I want that money later, okay, that you promised for. Okay. So you can do uh, no more missing data. Uh, it's a bit more complicated. You have to, uh, the optimization is a bit harder, but you can also deal with that. It's a more recent paper, a year ago. And the results are really great, but um, I, I don't need to keep like selling results for you. But what I wanted to, to say is that uh, um, even with the circuits, you can do the credo version robust attack. And the results are the same results we see for credo natus, uh, naive credo classifiers, but you can fit very big models. This really gets to state-of-the-art results on tabular data uh, with very fast uh, uh, inference methods. So for images, we are still behind. We cannot compete with neural nets, but for tabular data, you have state-of-the-art results. Well, because Basically, it's a type of random forest. Random forests have state-of-the-art results for um, uh, tabular data. And we are doing also the credo version of random forests in this case. You can attack them. And this is the, the graph that I wanted to show because this graph is telling uh, a lot about the, the, what the model can offer. It's not the final answer, but it's, it's what the model can offer. So every curve is a data set. Uh, from uh, OpenML uh, database. And I have to help you here to interpret the graph. So let's start with the left one. We trained the model, and here is the accuracy on the test set. Not on, it was already trained, and you have a test set. You never saw the test set, obviously, and we are going to run on the test set. Before uh, issuing a final classification, we do the trick of growing the epsilon. Okay, so for every instance that I get, you give me an object that I have to guess the class. I take the model and I start growing my epsilon contaminated until the, mo until the moment that my model is in doubt, I stop exactly there. So I have the epsilon for that instance. And I do that for every one of the instances. So after I do that, I can give for every instance, the class that the model is guessing and the largest epsilon that is still the model only tells me that class. If I go beyond that, then the model starts to be uncertain in the term. Okay, so let's look to the uh, left side. On the left side, what you have is the accuracy below the threshold. So basically, if you have um, uh, a point two here, so the accuracy at point two are the accuracy of all the instances that had a threshold below 0.2. Those are the, you can see the curves kind of go up. So 
for the cases that the epsilon was small, the accuracy was lower and it keeps growing. At this point in the middle, I have all the data points there. So that's the accuracy of the model if I would not look to the epsilon. That's exactly where the graphs cross. The graph on the right is the accuracy only for the instances that have an epsilon above the threshold that is here on the graph. So as I go to the uh, right now, I was saying left, right? Um, I'm very sorry for that. As I go to the right on the right graph, I'm issuing classification to fewer and fewer instances, but I better and better on what I'm saying because only the instances with large epsilon, I'm issuing classification. For the others, I'm, I'm not showing. That's what the graph shows. Okay, and on the left is the opposite, right? As I move to here, there are also fewer instances because are only those with small epsilon and they are the worst. That's why the graph goes down. So this is the credo version of the SPN. Actually, this is the credo version of the random forest. So you have a credo random forest, if you will. Uh, that's what the, 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 the graph is showing, which I think is the most prominent case of SPNs that uh, we have uh, at the moment. And then we have a, a, a bunch of examples to show that is very different if you look to the P of X, which could be seen as the likelihood of the point you have, and the epsilon of the epsilon contaminator on how much you can move on sensitivity. They are different. The P of X basically sucks in the sense that it always finds the same type of, of uh, example because it's just measuring how likely it is parts of the density of this thing. While the epsilon is really kind of trying to look to the boundaries of uh, when you change your mind, when the model is more sensitive or, or less sensitive. So that's, that's a, a nice uh, result. And you have Python code on that uh, if, if you want to. So this is my shameless uh, uh, part as Fabio ended with some shameless part doing advertisement of code, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the same. Um, and yes, there is a lot to, to, to move forward on this. Uh, what I wanted to, to, to finish with on this topic among those two models is that probabilistic circuits and, and these generative uh, forests, they are not as powerful as Bayesian networks. I'm talking here about the precise model, not even the imprecise. They have, a, the analogy is that they have a discrete latent space. The latent space are those some nodes. While a Bayesian network, if you have a hybrid version with continuous variables to not the discrete, in the discrete case, they are both equivalent in terms of what they can represent. But if you have a hybrid mode where you have continuous variables and discrete uh, variables together, the Bayesian networks are more powerful actually, because they allow for a sort of a, a continuous latent representation, just as you would find in uh, autoencode variation autoencoders and other generative uh, models based on deep learning. Probably circuits don't have that. Their latent space is discrete. You can make it discrete very big, but it's still discrete. So we have to uh, find ways of improving this. I wanted to mention why, where these models separate, but what you gain with the circuits is that they are very fast and you can have very, very large ones, even on the credo uh, side of it. So since I'm a minute, beyond my time. Um, okay, but I will use one minute for this slide because I think it's useful because there's answers also a question about uh, uh, attacking the model. All this was not really changing your data. It was always sensitivity on the model. The credo learning is a, it's a learning that uh, takes into consideration the fact that you might have scarce data, so you learn intervals. This last part I told you, it's a perturbation of the model. But what people are doing a lot right now is perturbation of the data, just as you saw in the, in the morning, right? These examples that you perturb the data a bit and then everything changes, right? And even in imperceptive ways. Those things are strongly connected. And I'm so surprised, which is a sentence that will show up uh, now, yes. I'm so surprised that the connection of imprecise probability and these adversarial attacks is not stronger actually at this moment because those two things are, they're not exactly the same, but they're so close. 
And in some of the models, including cradle networks and, and probabilistic circuits, we can do perturbation of the data or data augmentation by doing some tricks on some of those nodes and perturbing them. It's not the very same thing, but it's very similar. And the, the, let's say, the two boxes there, the changes you have to do are very small to do that kind of uh, attack on the data, perturbing the data. You can always, in, in some way, see the data as, as a part of a, your model by plugging it in the leaf nodes. Touch. We are trying this. Other people are trying the same thing on the attacking uh, circuits. Uh, so, but the connection with IP is weaker than I would believe it would be, and it uh, surprises me. So, I invite you all to change that. Try to look through this adversarial attacks, adversarial learning, um, conformal learning, uh, active learning, the connections of all this. There are so many people on all those things doing just IP without uh, calling it IP, that, uh, and I'm not blaming them for that. They're just coming from a different side. It's our fault that we are not really there, maybe, on connecting this. Maybe a bit of their fault, too. But uh, yeah, since I'm here in the room with you and they are not, so I would say it's their fault, uh, not yours. Uh, but anyway, I think this is uh, the way I want to finish. We should connect more because there are some things that are really you know, topical now. And uh, it's just IP with different names or different branding uh, around. So that's me. Um, I don't have uh, I don't have more here. I think the, the wrap up it's, it's it's clear at this point. Thanks. Sorry for talking so much.